Our next phylum is the largest by far, the arthropods. You can see there, uh, we always start with some clip art. And our clip art this time, not so bad compared to other clip art that we've seen in the past. It's really inaccurate. Uh, our dragonfly, not so bad. Our spider, not so bad. So we're always in the animal kingdom. And we're in phylum arthropoda. You learned that the poda part means foot. When we had cephalopods, it was head feet. When you had gastropods, it was stomach feet. Now we got arthropods. Apparently, that means jointed feet. And there are more species of them than all the other phylums uh, put together by quite a large margin. Characteristics are all going to have segmented bodies, uh, as you'll see later. They might be uh, two parts or three part bodies, but they'll have segmented bodies. They have an exoskeleton. Uh, made of protein and uh, chitin, which is a carbohydrate, and it acts as a water sealant. It, it seals their body so that they don't evaporate and lose a lot of water that way. They also have the jointed appendages, uh, and appendages, just to refresh your memory, things like legs and antenna, uh, maybe wings, um, anything that sticks out from the main body. And then uh, our, our organ systems continue to get more complex, and lots of our arthropods will have compound eyes. So, what do they eat? How do they eat? Well, with so many species, and we've discussed how numbers don't mean anything. We read different numbers in different sources all over the place, but there are literally millions of different species of arthropods. And so you have every possible kind of feeder. Herbivores, carnivores, om omnivores, uh, parasites, filter feeders, you name it, um, you have it. Lots of them have specialized mouth parts for helping them feed in whatever particular way it is that they do. As far as respiration uh, goes, we have three options. If they live in the water, they have gills, usually. Um, if they are on land, they breathe through tracheal tubes. And your trachea is that, that tube that connects your nasal passages in your mouth to your lungs. So it's a, a tube that, that moves air. It's the same thing with a <coughs> an insect or with an arthropod. A tracheal tube is uh, for... Uh, moving air through the body and the hole, the opening that allows the air in is called a spiracle. So they've got this hard outer shell made of chitin and there are holes in it called spiracles that allow the air in. The third option, um, some spiders have book lungs and I think I have a diagram here of a book lung on a spider. Right here. There you go. <coughs> and it's just a um, an area where uh, there is diffusion taking place, gas exchange, moist surface, all that kind of stuff, just like in your lungs. Um, and they call it a book lung because apparently uh, the way that it looks um, are kind of like the pages of a book. And so with those, the way that the uh, pages of the book are arranged, there's a lot of surface area for a lot of gas exchange in a relatively small area. So spiders will have book lungs, other terrestrial Arthropods will have tracheal tubes with spiracles, and then aquatics will have gills. As far as the circulation goes, we're back to an open circulatory system with well-developed hearts, keeping in mind that even though it's a well-developed heart, it's pumping the blood around, but it still doesn't have um, you know, atriums and ventricles and, and uh, different numbers of chambers and all that kind of stuff. It's basically just a muscular area on the blood vessel that contracts and pumps, moves blood around. Let's see here, excretory system, um, still a lot of diffusion going on, um, but we also have a specialized feature called a malpighian tubule, which extracts waste, waste um, the waste that is extracted from uh, the blood is then uh, dumped into the solid um, waste uh, excretory part of the system, leaves with the feces. The nervous system is pretty well developed in most of our arthropods. They have a brain, they have a nerve cord, they have ganglia along their body. Uh, we're going to dissect a grasshopper, and you'll notice on the diagram of the grasshopper, oops, if I can open it up here. Nope, over here. There we go. Diagram of the grasshopper. Is this the one I want? Let's go with this one. I apologize for it being turned up sideways, but that dark line on this side right here is the ventral nerve cord. 
and then it moves up and, and, and there's the brain. But you'll see there's a ganglia there and a ganglia there and a ganglia there and a ganglia there. So you've got a brain and a concentration of nerves on the anterior end, but then you've also got some concentrations of nerves along the way as well. So it's possible for them to have both. Uh, that allows for things like specialized sense organs, and an example would be a compound eye. You know, flies and grasshoppers have those big compound eyes. They see multiple images. It's thought that those help them detect uh, movement. Your grasshopper is going to have five eyes. It's going to have those two compound eyes, the big ones that you're probably familiar with and have seen. And it also has three simple eyes, those ocelli that we've talked about previously. They're just for detecting light. So five eyes for your grasshopper. Movement, uh, you know, muscles controlled by the nervous system, uh, flexor muscle, muscles, extender muscles for straightening and bending, uh, you know, legs and, and uh, wings and all of that sort of stuff. When we get to reproduction, it's going to be sexual reproduction, no asexual reproduction going on, and a lot of internal fertilization, but some external fertilization with our aquatic ones. Uh, we can have external fertilization because they don't have to worry about the eggs drying out if they are aquatic, but terrestrial, um, you know, usually in, uh, fertilization takes place and it's internal and then the eggs are laid um, someplace where they're not going to dry out or they have a little, a little uh, film over them kind of a thing. Growth and development, molting, the scientific term for that is ecdysis, E-C-Y-D-I-S-I-S. And there's another uh, thing on Moodle here somewhere where you'll uh, watch a little video about ecdysis on a giant water beetle. But anyway, it's when they shed, and they have to shed in order to grow. We mentioned that that, that uh, hard outer covering made of chitin um, that covers their body and keeps them from drying out uh, also prevents them from growing. It's not adjustable in size, so it hardens and they grow until it's like a shoe that's too tight and then there's that pressure that's built up inside and that triggers the endocrine system. The endocrine system um, produces some chemicals that uh, eat away at that, um, at that exoskeleton from the inside and there are areas where it's thinner so it cracks and then the animal uh, can crawl out of it. And once it crawls out, you know, it pumps air or water into its body to enlarge itself, puff itself up and then it secretes more chemicals uh, onto its, the surface of its body that are the new exoskeleton and it waits for it to harden. Once that hardens, then they'll pump out the air, pump out that water, whatever it was that they swelled their body up with, and um, they have a little bit of room inside there then to grow and they'll repeat the process. It's gonna be three main groups of arthropods we study, so they're all going to be subphylums. Remember with our classification, we have king's play chess on funny green stools and it, it gets from less specific to more specific. Well, we have subphylums and superphylums and subclasses and superclasses and suborders and superorders and all that kind of stuff all along. So these are going to be our first suborders, or excuse me, subphylums uh, that we've talked about. So the first one's crustaceans, and you're pretty familiar with them, crabs and shrimp and lobster and things like that that they like to go and eat, potentially. Um, they are aquatic. They have two pair of antenna. We'll do a crayfish dissection. You'll see those antenna, and then they also have the little antennules as well. Um, the crayfish that we dissect is going to have two body segments because the head and the thorax are fused together into a cephalothorax. Uh, they have chewing mouth parts, and you'll see that their jaws move differently than your jaws do. Your jaws move up and down, their jaws move back and forth, and your crayfish's mouth is going to be located about where your, the top of your chest would be, about where your sternum is. So, uh, something interesting to see. A decade is 10 years, a decapod is 10 legs or 5 pairs of legs, and then those big claws have a special name, um, they just refer to those as chelipeds. Chel there we go. We talked about the crayfish with the cephalothorax and the abdomen, right? Where they've got uh, ten legs, but they also had these little swimmerettes on the underside of the abdomen, and you'll see those on your crayfish. You can tell if your crayfish is a male or a female by looking at those swimmerettes and examining the first set or two 
if they are flimsy little things they're female if they're firmer and uh, pointed toward the anterior end of the animal uh, you're going to have a male so we'll take a look for that let's see the second subphylum is going to be chelicerata uh, spiders and their relatives and those fangs the chelicerae are what they're named after and you know that they're for stabbing or paralyzing their prey subduing their prey um, Pedipalps are little finger-like structures around usually the mouth and they use those to handle and manipulate the food to get it into their mouth. This subphylum is not going to have any antenna and two body segments. Again that cephalothorax and an abdomen. Uh, they're usually characterized by four pairs of walking legs. You know that spiders have eight legs. There are a couple of classes underneath um, that subphylum and so the first subclass is going to be Marostomata. Those are the horseshoe crabs and uh, much like earlier when we had the Portuguese man war that looked a lot like a jellyfish but it was actually a hydra, it was not a scyphozoa. You're going to have to remember the horseshoe crab is not a crustacean. It is an arachnid. Uh, don't ask me why. There must be some you know anatomical feature or something that makes it more like a spider than like a crab but anyway um, the second group though the second class the arachnids the spiders mites ticks and scorpions so a lot of them spin webs for silk um, other ones stalk and, and uh, catch their prey like tarantulas uh, if you have a pet tarantula or know anyone who has a pet tarantula go over and take a look at the cage and if you look carefully um, in the corners and in different places like that probably find some silk because they do produce silk but they're not using it to catch their prey whoops didn't mean to do that there we go <coughs> uh, mites and ticks parasitic uh, uh, piercing the skin why does it keep doing that I do not know um, what else do we need to know uh, some of them can be problematic things like Lyme, Lyme disease they bite you, leave that red bullseye looking mark, and then you get these symptoms that are usually hard to diagnose. Um, would be characteristic of Lyme disease. Scorpions, we had the conversation in class when we were doing the fun facts. Uh, you can die from scorpion stings. Um, usually it's if you have uh, more people that are dying or having things like uh, allergies, like uh, people who die don't normally die from bee stings, but if they have allergies, they might. And then we read somewhere else in that fun fact uh, in the animal book that scorpions are killing a lot of people every year, so I'm not quite sure. The third and final subphylum are the Uniranians, and I'm going to start on a separate um, screencast here because I've got two minutes left, and the Uniranians are the biggest group by far.